Welcome everybody. Thanks for traveling so far to be here tonight. Um, so studying a cell is hard. <laughs> to give you some idea of the difficulty of this challenge that we're presented with, imagine that you are brand new to the universe and you're looking for interesting phenomena to study. And you come across this little familiar system, the Earth revolving around the sun. Now it seems pretty simple, it's a simple circular motion, but after studying it for a little while, you'll start to notice that there are certain behaviors that this system exhibits um, that correlate with this cycle that's going on. So let's take the example of ice. You see ice beginning to form on the northern side of the planet um, when it travels through one part of the solar system and receding, and then appearing on the other side of the planet when it traverses the opposite side. Just wonder what is causing this. And without too much difficulty, you'd be able to come up with an explanation. The Earth is tilted, and when it's over there on the left, the uh, northern side is slanted away from the sun, not getting as much direct sunlight as the southern side is, um, vice versa on the other side. But now let's say you want to study a more subtle um, thing that goes on on the Earth. Rather than ice, you start to notice there are these other more detailed, more particular, and maybe even more beautiful phenomena that goes on. So let's take the phenomenon of fireworks. Fireworks happen at low rates on Earth all the time, but you notice that they <laughs> tend to cluster at these two very specific points. Right when it passes through this region of the solar system, there's a burst from the East Asian continent on the back. And right when it passes through this other section over here, there's a burst from the North American continent there. You start to wonder, well, what is going on? What is it about that region of space that's triggering fireworks coming out? Or are these fireworks somehow vital to the workings of this system? Are they some sort of corrective pattern that's keeping the Earth on its circular course, keeping it from spiraling inward into the sun? You can rack your brain for explanations like this all you want. Um, I think it's unlikely that in any reasonable period of time, even the length of a PhD, you would imagine that the true explanation is explained by scenes like this. Whereas one culture on one side of the world um, developed the concept of their year and put the start time near the coming of spring and chose to celebrate it by shooting off. And on the other side of the world, a different culture signed a document one day which led to a tremendous war and victory which is for some reason celebrated with the same uh, phenomenon of shooting these colorful rockets into the air and watching them explode. And also having fun festivities like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so this is because a lot of these phenomena that are going on in this what looks to be this large system are actually the result of the quirky behaviors of um, little things called cultures and peoples that happen within that larger system. And some of them are sort of vital to keeping the whole system going, and others of them are just sort of a habit that happens and keeps going. So this is what studying the cell is like. But in the cell, the quirky denizens that are responsible for these things are not human beings, but they're molecules that we call proteins. Now, proteins are responsible for cell behavior. I'm not gonna say all of cell behavior, because um, I know there are people down the hall in the Guthrie lab that would take issue with excluding RNA and some other molecules that play a role, but primarily everything that goes on in a cell is a result of interactions that are happening between different types of these proteins. These proteins are synthesized in this long spaghetti-like string of amino acids, which then by their interactions with each other, their attractions and repulsions causes the protein to fold into a characteristic shape. Every protein is different. Well, there are multiple copies of all of them, but they come in all different shapes and sizes, behaviors. Here's a beautiful animation that um, some people at Harvard put together to give you some sense of the chaos of what's going on in itself, all these different types of proteins floating around. And of course, in real life, the scene is even more packed than this. There's not all this vast expanse of space in between the proteins. They're all just jiggling, bumping up against one another, 
whatever. <laughs> so how do we begin to make sense of this? Well, first we want to think about what cell events, what states of the cell, what behaviors of the cell are correlated with which proteins are present in the cell at what time. And so I've created a, a series of little animations that give you sort of a way to think about what's going on in a cell. So here's a basic cell with a very simplified thing. Let's say there's only four types of proteins in the cell. Sort of like a bowl of lucky charms in here. And they're all just floating around at random um, in a pattern that physicists like to call Brownian motion. It's just sort of what happens when you shake something continuously. Um, no real direction. They bump into each other, they drift around. Um, you don't see a lot going on. And of course, in, in a real cell, it's not, the picture isn't quite as static as this because no protein lives forever. Each protein is synthesized and has a limited lifetime and then is destroyed. So the situation actually looks a little more like this, with proteins being created all the time, drifting around for a while, and then being destroyed. The end result is similar to what we saw before, just sort of a constant random mass of proteins. But now the cell has a way of controlling which proteins are synthesized at which times. And in doing so, you can set up a situation where at a certain time in the cell's life cycle, there's more of one protein and less of another. Um, this is done by what's called gene expression. It's basically controlling when the gene in the DNA is read by the protein synthesis machinery and turned into a protein. So let's modify this animation to have it where the yellow and orange proteins are all being synthesized at one time and then the blue and purple proteins are all being synthesized at another time. And very quickly you'll start to see the cell cycling through these states. A blue and purple state, a little transition, and then a yellow and orange state. So this is by regulating the synthesis, regulating the expression of its genes. It achieves this. And that's pretty cool that it can do this just by changing the, the synthesis of these proteins. Again, their lifetimes are still just kind of random. They degrade when they naturally sort of die of protein old age, as it were. Um, but in many cases in the cell, there are times where what one set of proteins is doing and what another set of proteins is doing, they can't be doing those things at the same time. The cell has to go through a lot of very complex steps. One step has to finish before the next step can begin. And so we're going to look at how this cell would evolve to set up a, a, a state where it has all the blue and purple stuff going on and then can stop that and immediately have the yellow and orange stuff taking over. Because if there's still any blue and purple hanging around when the yellow and orange proteins start doing their thing, there's going to be trouble. The cell's not going to proceed through its steps properly. And so one way that cells have evolved to do this is by what's called targeted degradation of proteins. So now, instead of the proteins just dying of old age, there's going to be a, a set moment in this cycle where all the blue and purple proteins are destroyed at once. And so what that looks like starts out kind of similar. Blue and purples come up, and now, nope, now. <laughs> uh, those are gone, and you have a yellow and orange state. So I'll actually go through that cycle again. I left the other side alone. That transition's not going to be as important for this stuff. There. They snap. They're all gone. But you might notice there's a problem here. And that problem is that they disappeared, but there was not a full complement of yellow and orange proteins ready to take over. So you're going to have this lag phase where neither set of proteins is, is doing its thing. Nothing's going on. Um, and you could back up the synthesis of the yellow and orange ones earlier, so you'll have a complement of them ready, but then you're going to run into the problem that they're going to start engaging in their activities before you have that moment where you cut off the blue and purple activities. So um, I should say before I move to that step that this targeted degradation step is something that about half of our lab um, dedicates their time working on. They're all doing really great work on figuring out exactly what mechanisms go into timing that destruction of proteins with uh, precise timing like that. Um, but then this, uh, this other half of the equation, which is what I've spent my entire time here working on and what a lot of other people in the lab have studied from various angles, is having proteins whose activity can be turned on and off in, in, in essence. I'll call them activatable proteins or switchable proteins. 
And so what this is going to enable us to do is synthesize those yellow and orange proteins early, but have them in inactive state. And then right at the same moment that you destroy all the blue and purple proteins, you're going to turn on the yellow and orange proteins. And so I'll represent the inactive ones by having them be gray. So you got this blue and purple. So you start synthesizing these gray proteins, and then destroy the blue and purples, and you turn on the yellow and oranges. And now we finally have achieved what we need to make this um, transition in the cell's life cycle happen properly which is to have this one moment where you switch from one type of protein profile to another. And so it's using regulation of the synthesis of the proteins by gene expression, targeted degradation of some proteins, and switchable activation of other proteins. So this is all pretty abstract. What's an actual example of this type of transition that I'm talking about? Well, the transition that happens right as the cell is getting ready to Arguably the most key moment in the cell's life cycle, or the cell cycle as we call it globally. Um, and uh, so mitosis is probably like a buzzword you remember from high school biology, the as a review. Mitosis is all about getting the DNA and its duplicated pairs lined up, separating it, and separating <coughs> the DNA to opposite parts of the cell. And then cytokinesis, the step that's often commonly mistaken for mitosis is the actual pinching of the cell in two. Cytokinesis can only happen after mitosis is complete because otherwise you could have all sorts of things going on. You could have the cell chopping its bits of DNA in half or you could have it swallowing up both copies of one chromosome and the other cell getting zero. Um, bad news when that happens. Um, so this is a perfect example of where all the steps of one process, mitosis, have to complete before all the steps of another process, cytokinesis, can begin. Again, both processes under control of a different set of proteins. So now, um, to further make this concept less abstract, what do I mean when I talk about a switch on a protein that can switch it from active to inactive? Proteins don't, they're not like electrical machines with an on-off switch. Um, they are uh, they're blobs of sticky things. And so, <laughs> so what does it mean to have a switch on it? Well, for the purposes of this talk, the, the switch that I'm going to be discussing is called the um, modification of a protein with surface phosphorylation, the addition of a, a phosphate molecule onto the surface of the protein. And the phosphate molecule this will be the only chemistry portion of the talk for the next couple slides. It's very simple chemistry. It's just four atoms in this molecule. P, four O's, phosphorus, four oxygens. Not much bigger than four water molecules kind of shoved up against each other. Um, and this phosphate group is something that you see recurring in all sorts of very key parts of cell biology. If you look at the membrane of the cell, the part of the cell that keeps um, the insides of the cell in and the outsides out, that protein is made of these phospholipids. And if you look at the top of one molecule is phospholipids, you see that little yellow and red portion, that's a phosphorus with four oxygens around it. It's a phosphate in there. Uh, if you remember anything about um, how energy is used in a cell, a process called cellular respiration, the sort of currency of cell energy is in this molecule called ATP. And that stands for adenosine triphosphate, three phosphates on the end there. And then if you look at DNA itself, the most charismatic of all biological molecules, um, <laughs> you see this world famous double helix, these lettered bases that you may have heard of. And if you look on the backbone, you have these alternating circle of pentagon structures. If you zoom in on that a little, those circles are, you guess it, phosphates, PO4 in there. So why is this phosphate molecule so commonly used in all of these super essential processes, in all these essential structures of what makes living things what they are? Um, and the answer is it's, to my mind anyway, it's not just sort of an arbitrary choice of what to construct with. It's, has a very special set of chemical properties that make it useful for that. Um, for one thing, it's got this polarized negative charge on it, which helps it interact with water. It's hydrophilic, as they say, which suits it very well to being 
on the sides of the membrane that face to the water-based environments on the inside and outside of the cell. Um, and it also has this really peculiar property of its energy profile. Um, now, in biology and in physical chemistry, when we talk about energy, we're talking in a sense of like, it's sort of analogous to potential energy in the mechanical world, um, where things want to roll downhill because they have more energy at the top and less energy at the bottom. Um, in chemistry and biology, things want to get to their lowest energy state. And in, in, in chemistry, many times the lowest energy state is the formation of bonds between atoms. That's why, for instance, in the air, we don't find oxygen atoms by themselves, but in the pair it's called O2, because it's, it's favorable, it's low energy for that bond to form. Well, this bond between the phosphorus and oxygen in the phosphate group is the opposite of that. It's, it's unfavorable, it wants to be broken. And yet, unlike some other high energy bonds, it's actually very stable in time. So that's why this ATP is such a perfect vehicle for storing energy, because it'll, until that bond is intentionally broken by something, it'll store that energy in that bond. And that's also why it's used to build DNA, um, <clears throat> where DNA is synthesized from groups like molecules a lot like that ATP that um, use the energy stored in them to sort of snap into place, provide the energy right there to build this long chain of DNA, and that's why that can be done so fast. So, cool stuff. I, I always thought phosphate is a really cool molecule, and I feel lucky that I sort of stumbled my way into having my entire thesis work be about that, that molecule. So protein phosphorylation, that's the fourth use of this. And that is where you take the ATP molecule, use the energy stored in that, and with an enzyme catalyzing that, we need to worry about catalysis, that's complicated. Um, <laughs> but it'll, it'll find a group where there's an exposed hydroxyl on the carbon, and pull a phosphate off of the ATP and attach it onto the protein. And for the purposes of this talk, we can think of the protein with the phosphate on it, the phosphorylated form of the protein as the, as the inactive version, and the dephosphorylated form, the sort of native protein, as the active version. There are, of course, plenty of examples where that's flipped, because it's all based on you know, what effect putting that thing on the protein has, but for the purposes of this talk, we can think of the phosphorylated form as inactive, and the dephosphorylated form as active. At least that's what I sort of set out to try to prove in this entire for this particular protein that you're going to hear about. Um, and you heard Dave mention that I had a first project that, um, you know, kind of dead-ended after putting in two years or so into it, which was, you know, a valuable learning experience. I don't regret any of that. In case you're curious what those two years went into, it was all studying this enzyme that does the reverse reaction, the clipping of the phosphate off of the protein. I was hoping to get at some general principles of how it's decided where and when different proteins have the phosphates removed. Um, that proved difficult to get measurements precise enough to, to get that to work. Um, so I moved on instead to looking at specific examples of proteins that are phosphorylated and asking what is the addition or removal of the phosphate doing to that protein's behavior. And so one last general thing about what I mean when I say protein activity or protein behavior. Proteins work by sticking to each other, basically. Um, there are ones that do more complex, uh, kind of amazing machine-like things, but for what we're talking about, we mostly are just talking about proteins assembling themselves into machine-like structures, and that all happens by how they stick to each other. And I have this fun demonstration of how that works, which is, you know, step away from the slides, do a little physical magic show here. <laughs> So these are proteins. This particular type of protein, this green one, has a side that's fuzzy on one side and filled with hooks on the other side. And I have a whole bunch that are just like that. And so you can probably predict, if I throw them all together and allow them to stick, what kinds of structures they might form. And so you provide a little brownie in motion. There you go. And Get a big one, get a big one. There it is. And in fairly short order, we finally form one. 
including your chains. <laughs> <laughs> you instead have two different kinds of proteins, this is the last one, <laughs> instead of two different kinds of proteins, these red ones that have two hook-like sides at right angles, and then these white proteins that just have a single fuzzy side, and if anybody wants to guess what kind of structures they think these will form, shout it out. thinking about how proteins assemble in a cell is that proteins don't, they don't go looking for each other. They don't have little motors directing them towards each other. They're all just vibrating around and if they happen to bump into each other and they happen to have a compatible stickiness, they'll stick. And this actually works in similar ways to some sort of human behavior in a mode that I think was best expressed by uh, contemporary social commentator Dr. Dre. <laughs> His, uh, insightful, if a little bit heteronormative, description of the dynamics of a particularly raucous party, where he noted that with all these gentlemen <laughs> and all these ladies, you know somebody here is in trouble. <laughs> that's sort of how it works. <laughs> Alright, so the proteins that I'm talking about for this talk is, there's a protein called actin, which is a protein like this. They form these long linear chains. You can see there a chain of those sort of gold spheres represented as forms a filament of actin. And then there's this other protein called myosin, which is that red thingamabobber <laughs> that um, actually has an activity that it can sort of flex like this and stick to the cable. And when energy is added to this system, that red myosin will actually walk along the actin cable. And this is used for lots of different purposes, but probably the most well-known purpose is this is what makes the muscles in your body work. Your muscles are nothing but a long series of these actin cables arranged, millions and millions of them in bundles, with then these myosin proteins bundled together, holding them together. And if you imagine each of those little heads doing that walking action shown above, the net effect of that is it pulls them together. And so that's what happens when your muscle is from extended to short. Now, you can get fancy with this, and instead of building them in a straight line like they are in your muscles, you can build them in a ring. And when the same activity happens, that ring will contract. And this is actually how the cell mechanically divides. So you can see the animal cell is the cell we're all most familiar with on the left, that gold band around it, that's a band of actin and myosin, the actomyosin ring. It's a contractile ring, it contracts and squeezes the cells apart. In budding yeast, they have the same thing, it's that little blue ring, but since yeast reproduce by budding like gremlins, uh, <laughs> most of the work of contraction is actually kind of already done. And this is very useful to us because um, it enables us to make mutations and perturb that ring and the cell can still survive and like muddle through and manage to separate itself because so much of the work is already done. This makes it a great tool for studying these things. There's a close-up of how these proteins are thought to line up along the membrane, very similar to that little animation I just showed, how they do it. All right. So in these yeast cells, in order to get that functional contractile machine in place, it's the end result of work that's been done throughout the entire cell cycle. Starting before there even is a bud, there's one group of proteins. You don't need to remember any of these names, except for one that I'll point out to you. Um, one group of proteins called septins that forms a circle there and actually determines where the bud's going to start growing. As the cell progresses through its life cycle, more and more proteins accumulate there, always in the same order, until one of the very last ones that gets there is 
active, the cables that actually do the constricting. And so for various reasons based on lots of previous research in um, generally how the cell cycle is regulated and um, other types of um, interactions between these proteins and dependencies, we formed a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that the final stages of the assembly of this ring are in some way regulated by um, phosphorylation of these proteins, specifically by the removal of phosphates from some proteins. We mainly thought that because at this point in the cell cycle is right when the cell switches from sticking phosphates all over a lot of things to removing phosphates from a lot of things. And so that was our hypothesis, that at least one of these proteins there's a step in here where it's being activated by having phosphates removed from it, and that is what's timing the finishing of this assembly and the contraction of the ring. So how do we study this? Well, what we wanted to do, what we wanted to do is actually see the actin in the cell and see if we can make a change to how the phosphorylation is working that would affect how the, uh, where and when the actin is forming that little ring or when the ring is contracted. But how do you see actin? Like I said before, the cell is a mess. Proteins, unlike in my little cartoon, they're, they're not all different bright colors. They're all just kind of vaguely serum-y looking. <laughs> and uh, so you need a way to make one protein stand out from the rest. And we do this with fluorescence microscopy. You gotta make something fluorescent to see it. And there turns out to be a great tool for making actin fluorescent, and it's the toxin from the death cat mushroom, the most poisonous mushroom in the world, I think. That's what my friend Booth told me, he's a mushroom <laughs> <laughs> And so this is from this death cat mushroom. This is going to be one of several instances throughout this talk where I show you how study of some seemingly obscure part of the natural kingdom ended up yielding a tool that's generally useful for the study of biology as a whole. And so that's very important if anybody ever asks why, you, why would anybody study like bizarre, like rare cone snails or mushrooms or anything like that. Um, so yeah, so this toxin, which is what will kill you if you eat this mushroom, the way it works is that it binds onto your cables of actin and locks them into place. It prevents them from having the dynamic properties that enable your cells to divide, your muscles to work, your cells to hold their shape, all kinds of things like that. But if you take this molecule and treat a cell that's been fixed in formaldehyde with it and attach something fluorescent onto it, then suddenly you can see wherever these actin cables are in the cell. Okay, so the experiment we wanted to do with this is to somehow mess with the phosphorylation system and see if that changes where the actin is. So what we did first is we messed with the enzyme that puts phosphates on things. Um, a lab here in UCSF developed this really cool method of, um, in, in a very quick time frame, disabling that enzyme. And so anything that would be getting phosphates stuck onto it suddenly doesn't have them stuck on there. And so we set up this experiment where we grow cells. We can grow cells that are sensitive to uh, this en enzyme disabling drug or not. We arrest them in a state, we use this other drug that causes the cells to arrest at the point right before they do the key step of mitosis. So they're sort of hovering there, waiting to do their mitosis and cell division, all that. And then we do a quick 15 minute incubation with this drug that will disable that phosphorylating enzyme. And then we look at the eye. And now we, that's where the presentation starts to get pretty. So the, all the green is showing active. The blue is using another dye that makes uh, DNA glow conveniently blue. So you can see that just to sort of warn yourself in the cell where the nucleus is in the lab. And so in the upper left, that's what happens when you have just a regular cell. We use this abbreviation WT a lot. That means wild type. That means normal, not mutated, as found in the wild, sort of, because they're in their lab strains and all that. Um, and then we see the actin, and the actin generally 
clusters on the surface in these little patches. We're not concerned about those. We're only interested in rings found at the junction between where the cells are about to divide. And uh, when we use the mutant cells alone, we don't get a lot of those rings. When we add the drug by itself, we don't get a lot. But when we use the drug-sensitive yeast strain and add this drug to knock out the phosphorylating enzyme, we start to see bands of green forming at the bud neck of the cell. Some stronger than others. There's a particular good one. Um, but that's the effect. And after a lot of um, time in the microscope and counting these cells and squinting to see whether there was really a ring there, we were able to get a quantitative measure of that. And you can see we went from under 10% in the control case to almost 80% in the test case where we've messed with the phosphorylation. All right, so that's good. That means we were right in our hypothesis that phosphorylation somehow affects the assembly of these things. I should say what this means is that that ring is forming at a time when it otherwise wouldn't be. And so the conclusion is that something is phosphorylated, protein is phosphorylated, is being held inactive, and it's preventing that ring from forming. But when you get rid of those phosphates, you are like artificially activating some protein and having the ring there where it shouldn't be. So the question became, what is that protein? And there are all these proteins that are involved in the chain making activity, but we zeroed in on one in particular, which is called IQG1. It's one of the last things that gets there right before the actin did. A lot of other scientists have discovered that it's actually directly necessary for the actin if you delete that protein, the actin never arrives, the cells don't divide. Um, and then work in our own lab that was completed just when I was joining the lab actually used fancy mass spectrometry techniques to show that there were, in fact, phosphate groups on this protein, IQG1. Um, that top, that's like a linear map of the protein if you stretched it out the way it was synthesized. Um, and wherever there's an asterisk is a spot that we know there's a phosphate on it, and that phosphate seems to be dependent on the same enzyme that we disabled in the last experiment. The other blue and uh, cyan lines there are other possible sites where there could be phosphate. We don't know for sure. But just to be safe, I wanted to mutate all of those for these experiments. So the new hypothesis is that it's IQG1 that the phosphate is having its effect through. And so it's removing the phosphates from that protein, from IQG1, that is triggering the assembly and possibly the contraction of the ring. So we did a similar experiment, but this time instead of knocking out the enzyme, which is going to affect all proteins that are getting phosphates on them, we just knocked out the little hydroxyl groups on the protein. And that can be done by changing the actual gene of the, uh, that codes for this protein so that it puts an amino acid with no hydroxyl group and therefore this chemical reaction that puts the phosphate on there cannot happen. It'll never get the phosphate on Now doing this, this part that's usually skipped over in almost every time because it's so routine these days, but um, it actually takes up a lot of work and is maybe the number one source of complaint among uh, working scientists is difficulties with cloning. Uh, and cloning a gene essentially just means finding the gene in the, uh, the genome of the, of the cell and all the many, many billions of bases of DNA, I think it's less than that yeast, um, and taking that cell and pulling it out and making it into many, many, many copies that are on a small section of DNA that can be worked with and manipulated can have certain sections of it mutated the way we need to. And this is another case where a seemingly obscure organism contributed to uh, the ability to do this. This is all enabled by a, um, a reaction called PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. And that uses an enzyme from this bacteria that's only found in hot springs that's able to replicate DNA at very high temperatures. And so it enables this artificial rounds of DNA replication done outside of a cell in a targeted way. I can turn one copy 
of a gene into millions of copies that you can then work with. And this process um, is cool because it uses such an interesting enzyme, and also because along with the personal computer, the Triangle Offense, and the Conceptual Rock album is one of the modern marvels of the modern world that was inspired by usage of LSD. <laughs> So what we did is that same sort of experiment, only instead of, uh, instead of messing with the global phosphorylation, we just used this mutant of IQG1 that had all those hydroxyls removed from it. And we saw a similar effect, actin rings where there normally wouldn't be. And comparing it to that previous figure, you can see it's about the same level, which means that pretty much this IQG1 phosphorylation explains that effect that we saw. We also did another experiment where instead of artificially trapping the cells in that pre-mitosis state, we let them just grow normally and fix them at random points, but we, we used another fluorescent technique to label these spindle poles, which are the parts that are pulling the DNA apart from each other, so we can distinguish cells that have or have not undergone mitosis in that way. And we found that in the wild type case, you only see the rings in cells that have already finished mitosis, but in the IQG phosphomutant states, you see cells like this one that have the ring and have yet to extend and separate their DNA. So here's the, the quantification of that. We divide the cells into two groups, the pre anaphase cells, the ones that have not separated yet, and the ones that have. You only see actin rings in the phosphomutant case in the pre mitotic pre anaphase. So this brought us to our first major conclusion, which is that phosphorylation inhibits IQG1's activity with respect to assembling actin at the button. Now how would it do this? There's basically two hypotheses. And one is that that phosphorylation is keeping IQG1 itself from getting to the button. So you remove the phosphate, the IQG1 can now stick to whatever is at the button, and then actin will in turn stick to the IQG1. The other possibility is that the phosphorylated form is already stuck at the budnet, but is not sticky to actin. And so the removal of the phosphate allows actin to stick to the IQG1. Now it could be both of these, but we want to do at least test whether, test whether the first one is true. And so to do this we wanted to, we wanted to watch the movement of IQG1 itself. And we wanted to do this in the case of live cells that are actively going through their life cycle. And so here is yet another case of a cool organism providing an awesome tool, the green fluorescent protein from this crystal jelly found in the deep sea that's able to produce a green glow. And this protein, you don't have to fix the cells in formaldehyde like on that previous slide at all. <coughs> um, we would have done this on actin if we could, but it just doesn't work on all proteins, and it happens to not work on actin. But it works with this one. So, here's just a reminder of where those spindle poles are. There, these things. See, spindle pole. Um, those are going to be tagged in red using a slightly modified version of this protein, the red fluorescent protein, and the IQG1 would be in green. I apologize to Ben if they look exactly the same to you. <laughs> So now we can look at a group of cells as they're dividing, going through their life cycle, and we can see these bands of IQG1 forming at the ring. And now we get to the fun part where we can actually see the rings forming and then contracting, squeezing the cells apart. And also pay attention to the red dots, how they go from being close together to elongating to opposite ends of the cell um, when they are undergoing the end stages of mitosis and pulling the DNA. This is, what, this is what that situation looks like. So the first time I got these movies to work, I spent most of that day just sort of like watching them on loop and marveling at it. But then I was like, okay, back to work. I have to actually find a way to count whether there's a difference between the mutant and the control case. And so that's what I'm going to demonstrate here. Here's the wild type case, and 
Watch uh, this cell and this cell are ones that are going to, during this movie, um, finish growing their buds. They're going to elongate the spindle, separate the DNA, um, and then the ring's going to form and then pinch it apart. And you'll notice that the ring doesn't form until after the spindle has elongated. So that one just elongated, and then the ring started to come in. And Okay, now in the phosphomutant case, the case that cannot have the phosphates added, um, look at the two cells in the upper left, that one and this one, and you're going to see that the ring forms well before the spindle elongates. So, this one's still further, but yeah, there's blood coming out. You can see it, it's gonna faint bigger. Uh, they're starting to see a ring on that lower one, and now the spindle elongates, but the ring's already pretty much all the way there. Everybody see it? Okay. So, that was cool. I was seeing a lot of those cases in the phosphomutant and not so much in the wild type, and then I had to figure out a way to prove that that was a significant effect. And so I was doing a lot of work early on with sort of marking the time when I could first see what I thought was a clear band of green across there and saying how many minutes after or before the spindle elongated is that. And so I'd mark it on there. So in the wild type, is some, you know, a few, a few that went early. Those are sort of aberrations in the mutant. But we sort of knew that when we were trying to publish in some of these competitive journals that saying, well, I saw a, uh, I saw a ring there, and like we knew that wouldn't really fly, so we had to come up with a much better way of quantifying that. Um, let me see that. So this is figuring out a way to quantify it. So this is taking that movie, like we saw, we want to figure out a way to track the bud neck at each one and actually measure in a quantitative way how much fluorescence is being detected there as a readout of how much protein has assembled there at each moment. And so the first step in doing this required uh, some fancy um, computer programming done in-house by people like Kurt Thorne and Nico Sturman, who, who uh, developed all the microscopy software um, on, on their own um, to find a way to subtract out that movement. So you'll see now the cells do not drift at all. They're locked in. After doing this, we're able to then say, OK, for each point in the cell, let's record what its brightest point over the entire movie is. And so we go from a movie to a static image. So that's at every pixel. You'll see whatever it was at its brightest point in the whole movie. Each of the movies takes about two hours, by the way. You're watching it sped up. Um, and then doing that, you're able to define where each bud neck is from that image. And then going back into the original movie, you can define a region of interest. So that's that little, that little ring up at the top there is based on that black smudge. I said, OK, let's measure the intensity of fluorescence at that spot at every moment over the two hours. And you let the movie play, and you get a cool curve. So this is like two cells. And then for each cell, you also mark when that elongation point happened. And then you can take the whole curve and slide it left or right so that zero falls where that spindle elongation happened. And you do this with a whole bunch of cells. And you get to see, it. oh good, they all kind of follow the stereotype pattern, which is what you want if something is being regulated nicely by the cell. But now you compare to what it looks like in the phosphomutant and you, I showed in red here, and you'll see those tend to be accumulating their fluorescence early compared to wild type, which matches what we all saw by eye, right? That they have a ring being visible before the spindle elongates. And now that it's all done quantitatively, we're able to do statistical analysis, like show what the average and the standard deviation is at every time point, showing that there's a clear early buildup of IQG1 happening. And we also get a little bit more interesting information about this that we didn't get just looking by eye, which is that 
while the beginning of the accumulation happens early, it still reaches its peak at the same time. And so that suggests that even when you've removed this inhibiting phosphorylation from the protein, there's still something else that is keeping IPG1 from getting all the way to its full inhibition. And that is actually still an open question of, um, of how that works now. But so we wanted to know what is accounting for this early accumulation of the non-phosphorylated protein. What is IQG1 sticking to that it's more sticky to without the phosphate than it is with it? And so we started doing some biochemistry where we actually mashed up some cells and used an antibody that would stick onto the GFP that was on the IQG1 and separate that out from the whole rest of the mess of the mashed up cells and uh, pull out IQG1 and anything that it was stuck to. And then we put it through the mass spectrometry facility down here, which can somewhat magically just take a mix of proteins and identify them based on their masses. Um, and we found two major ones. One is called MLC1. That's a protein that we already knew interacted with IQG1. The other is called HOF1, which uh, we did not previously know interacted with it. Now, I was kind of hoping that one of these bands would be stronger in the phosphamine than in the wild type case, which would mean that more of that protein had stuck to the dephosphorylated IQG1 than to the phosphorylated one. We didn't see any obvious differences like that. It doesn't mean they're not there, just not detectable at this sort of precision. But we did have this new interaction to think about, and it's this protein HOF1, which keen eyes might remember was in that chain of proteins. And it's part of this other suite of proteins that are involved not with the contracting of the ring, kind of, um, but, it, but with a separate process called septation, the building of the, the cell wall between two yeast cells. And you can see on some electron microscope pictures taken from another lab how this cell wall is built, this little septum that forms across two cells. And it's also known that there's an interaction between the contracting ring and the septum. Because in this mutant, we've removed the myosin, one of the central components of the actomyosin ring. The primary septum doesn't grow right. So we were, or, yeah, we were excited to look at the question of, well, does changing the IQG1 phosphorylation change some of the assembly of those other proteins, those septum proteins, including this one, HOF1, that, um, like I said, sticks to IQG1. Immediately new conclusions, but in the realm of just sort of descriptive cell biology, this is now sort of the most complete picture of the exact order at which time everything's getting there. So I, I, I like to look at it that way. And it is also interesting because it shows that the phosphomutant, in fact, switched the order of when IQG1 arrives at the bud neck and when this HOF1 protein arrives at the bud neck. In a wild type case, HOF1 starts appearing first, followed by IQG1. In this case, the IQG1 is shifted so early that it's actually now earlier than the HOF1 curve, even though the HOF1 curve itself is slightly shifted. And so that's interesting, and um, I don't know, leads to, has led to some rampant speculation on my part that Dave cautioned me against, including in our publication. I thought that since there's this slight curve in the gold line here, that it suggests that this first part of HOF1 accumulation happens on its own, and then once IQG1 starts arriving, the IQG1 is involved in this sort of feedback that is then recruiting more HOF1 to it, and so the HOF1 is sort of appearing in this two-phase thing, and that that's why the HOF1 has been shifted a little bit earlier is because the IQG1 gets there earlier, and so the HOF1 jumps the gun getting there first. But you know, like I said, that's all speculation. That's, that's just kind of fun stuff to think about. So the third and the final conclusion for this uh, presentation here is that IQG1 and HOF1 interact with each other. They stick to each other at the bud neck. That feedback, that was that speculation I was just sort of going on about. And that the, importantly, the dephosphorylated IQG1 is not sufficient to perturb the final events of cytokinesis the actual contraction itself. I didn't really draw attention to this on some of those curves, but you may have noticed that the 
the drop in levels, which is when that ring is squeezing shut and contracting, um, was unchanged in my mutant. And so that means there's something else that's controlling that timing. Even when you've, even when you've made the assembly happen prematurely, um, it doesn't make the entire event happen prematurely. This is very common in biolog biological regulation, that there's sort of multiple redundant layers of protection against things happening catastrophically early. Um, things that protect the uh, event B from going before event A is finished. So remaining questions that if I had another seven years here, I would love to tackle include uh, what is that final tr trigger to push the cell into contraction and full cell separation? Or conversely, what is the barrier that's keeping that from happening, the barrier that's then removed? Um, and then does the phosphorylation of any other proteins play a role? And if any of you who have ever heard me complain about my work here in the past um, are worried that I haven't been enjoying myself, you should know that as of about three hours ago, I was processing some last minute data on the phosphomutant of some of the other proteins to see if maybe there was an effect that I could include in here. Um, I didn't see any, unfortunately. <laughs> but that should show that I do, I do enjoy what I do, what I've done here, and it's been a good time. So thanks, and I'll take any questions on science before I proceed to acknowledge this. Yes, I